Part Three, Chapter Two of An Outcast of the Islands by Joseph Conrad. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Two. After a long silence, during which Almayer had moved towards the table and sat down, his head between his hands, staring straight before him, Lingard, who had recommenced walking, cleared his throat and said, "What was it you were saying?" ah yes you should have seen this settlement that night i don't think anybody went to bed i walked down to the point and could see them they had a big bonfire in the palm grove and the talk went on there till the morning when i came back here and sat in the dark veranda in this quiet house i felt so frightfully lonely that i stole in and took the child out of her cot and brought her here into my hammock if it hadn't been for her i am sure i would have gone mad I felt so utterly alone and helpless. Remember, I hadn't heard from you for four months. Didn't know whether you were alive or dead. Patalolo would have nothing to do with me. My own men were deserting me like rats to a sinking hulk. That was a black night for me, Captain Lingard. A black night as I sat here not knowing what would happen next. They were so excited and rowdy that I really feared they would come and burn the house over my head. I went in and brought my revolver laid it loaded on the table. There were such awful yells now and then. Luckily the child slept through it, and seeing her so pretty and peaceful steadied me somehow. Couldn't believe there was any violence in this world looking at her lying so quiet and so unconscious of what went on. But it was very hard. Everything was at an end. You must understand that on that night there was no government in Sambir, nothing to restrain those fellows. Patalolo had collapsed. I was abandoned by my own people, and all that lot could vent their spite on me if they wanted. They know no gratitude. How many times haven't I saved this settlement from starvation, absolute starvation? Only three months ago I distributed again a lot of rice on credit. There was nothing to eat in this infernal place. They came begging on their knees. There isn't a man in Sambir, big or little, who is not in debt to Lingard and Company not one. You ought to be satisfied. You always said that was the right policy for us. Well, I carried it out. Ah, Captain Lingard, a policy like that should be backed by loaded rifles. You had them, exclaimed Lingard in the midst of his promenade, that went on more rapid as Almayer talked, the headlong tramp of a man hurrying on to do something violent. The veranda was full of dust, oppressive and choking, which rose under the old seaman's feet, and made Almayer cough again and again. Yes, I had, twenty, and not a finger to pull a trigger. It's easy to talk, he spluttered his face very red. Lingard dropped into a chair, and leaned back with one hand stretched out at length upon the table, the other thrown over the back of his seat. The dust settled, and the sun surging above the forest flooded the veranda with a clear light. Almayer got up and busied himself in lowering the split rattan screens that hung between the columns of the veranda. "'Phew,' said Lingard. "'It will be a hot day. That's right, my boy. Keep the sun out. We don't want to be roasted alive here.' Almayer came back, sat down, and spoke very calmly. "'In the morning I went across to see Patalolo. I took the child with me, of course. I found the water-gate barred and had to walk round through the bushes.' Patalolo received me lying on the floor in the dark, all the shutters closed. I could get nothing out of him but lamentations and groans. He said, you must be dead. That Lakamba was coming now with Abdullah's guns to kill everybody. Said he did not mind being killed as he was an old man, but that the wish of his heart was to make a pilgrimage. He was tired of men's ingratitude. He had no heirs. He wanted to go to Mecca and die there he would ask Abdullah to let him go. Then he abused Lakamba, between sobs, and you a little. You prevented him from asking for a flag that would have been respected. He was right there, and now when his enemies were strong he was weak, and you were not there to help him. When I tried to put some heart into him, telling him he had four big guns, you know the brass six-pounders you left here last year? That I would get powder and that perhaps together we could make head against Lakamba, he simply howled at me. No matter which way he turned, he shrieked, the white men would be the death of him, while he wanted only to be a pilgrim and be at peace. My belief is, added Almayer after a short pause, 
and fixing a dull stare upon Lingard, that the old fool saw this thing coming for a long time, and was not only too frightened to do anything himself, but actually too scared to let you or me know of his suspicions. Another of your particular pets. Well, you have a lucky hand, I must say. Lingard struck a sudden blow on the table with his clenched hand. There was a sharp crack of splitting wood. Almayer started up violently, then fell back in his chair and looked at the table. There, he said moodily, you don't know your own strength. This table is completely ruined. The only table I have been able to save from my wife. By and by I will have to eat squatting on the floor like a native. Lingard laughed heartily. Well, then, don't nag at me like a woman at a drunken husband. He became very serious after a while and added, If it hadn't been for the loss of the flash, I would have been here three months ago, and all would have been well. No use crying over that. Don't you be uneasy, Casper. We will have everything ship-shape here in a very short time. What? You don't mean to expel Abdul out of here by force? I tell you, you can't. Not I, exclaimed Lingard. That's all over, I'm afraid. Great pity. They will suffer for it. He will squeeze them. Great pity. Damn it. I feel so sorry for them if I had the flash here. I would try force, eh? Why not? However, the poor flash is gone, and there is an end of it. Poor old hooker, eh, Almayer? You made a voyage or two with me. Wasn't she a sweet craft? Could make her do anything but talk. She was better than a wife to me, never scolded, eh? And to think that it should come to this, that I should leave her poor old bones sticking on a reef as though I had been a damned fool of a southern-going man who must have half a mile of water under his keel to be safe. Well, well, it's only those who do nothing that make no mistakes, I suppose. But it's hard, hard. He nodded sadly with his eyes on the ground. Almayer looked at him with growing indignation. Upon my word you are heartless, he burst out, perfectly heartless and selfish. It does not seem to strike you, in all that, that in losing your ship, by your recklessness, I am sure, you ruin me, us, and my little Nina. What's going to become of me and of her? That's what I want to know. You brought me here, made me your partner, and now, when everything is gone to the devil, through your fault, mind you, you talk about your ship. Ship! You can get another. But here, this trade, that's gone now, thanks to Willems, your dear Willems. Never mind about Willems. I will look after him, said Lingard severely and as to the trade, I will make your fortune yet, my boy, never fear. Have you got any cargo for the schooner that brought me here? The shed is full of rattans, answered Almayer, and I have about eighty tons of gutta in the well. The last lot I ever will have, no doubt, he added bitterly. So after all there was no robbery. You've lost nothing, actually. Well, then you must— Hello, what's the matter? Here! Robbery? No! screamed Almayer, throwing up his hands. He fell back in the chair, and his face became purple. A little white foam appeared on his lips and trickled down his chin, while he lay back, showing the whites of his upturned eyes. When he came to himself he saw Lingard standing over him, with an empty water chatty in his hand. "'You had a fit of some kind,' said the old seaman with much concern. "'What is it? You did give me a fright, so very sudden.' Almayer, his hair all wet and stuck to his head, as if he had been diving, sat up and gasped. Outrage! A fiendish outrage! I... Lingard put the chatty on the table and looked at him in attentive silence. Almayer passed his hand over his forehead and went on in an unsteady tone. When I remember that, I lose all control, he said. I told you he anchored Abdullah's ship abreast our jetty, but over to the other shore near the Rajah's place. The ship was surrounded with boats. From here it looked as if she had been landed on a raft. Every dugout in Sambir was there. Through my glass I could distinguish the faces of people on the poop. Abdullah, Willems, Lakamba, everybody. That old cringing scoundrel Sahamin was there. I could see quite plain. There seemed to be much talk and discussion. Finally I saw a ship's boat lowered. Some Arab got into her, and the boat went towards Patalolo's landing place. It seems they had been refused admittance, so they say. I think myself that the water gate was not unbarred quick enough to please the exalted messenger. At any rate, I saw the boat come back almost directly. I was looking on rather interested 
when I saw Willems and some more go forward, very busy about something there. That woman was also amongst them. Ah, that woman! Almayer choked and seemed on the point of having a relapse, but by a violent effort regained a comparative composure. All of a sudden, he continued, bang, they fired a shot into Patalolo's gate, and before I had time to catch my breath, I was startled, you may believe, they set another and burst the gate open, whereupon, I suppose, they thought they had done enough for a while, and probably hungry for a feast began aft. Abdullah sat amongst them like an idol, cross-legged, his hands on his lap. He's too great altogether to eat when others do, but he presided, you see. Willems kept on dodging about forward, aloof from the crowd, and looking at my house through the ship's long glass. I could not resist it. I shook my fist at him. "'Just so,' said Lingard gravely. "'That was the thing to do, of course. If you can't fight a man, the best thing is to exasperate him.' Almayer waved his hand in a superior manner and continued unmoved. "'You may say what you like. You can't realize my feelings.' He saw me, and, with his eye still at the small end of the glass, lifted his arm as if answering a hail. I thought my turn to be shot at would come next after Patalolo, so I rang up the Union Jack to the flagstaff in the yard. I had no other protection. There were only three men besides Ali that stuck to me, three cripples for that matter, too sick to get away. I would have fought single-handed, I think, I was that angry, but there was the child. What to do with her? couldn't send her up the river with the mother, you know I can't trust my wife. I decided to keep very quiet, but to let nobody land on our shore. Private property, that, under a deed from Patalolo. I was within my right, wasn't I? The morning was very quiet. After they had a feed on board the bark with Abdullah, most of them went home. Only the big people remained. Towards three o'clock Sahamin crossed alone in a small canoe. I went down on our wharf with my gun to speak to him, but didn't let him land. The old hypocrite said Abdullah sent greetings and wished to talk with me on business. Would I come on board? I said no, I would not. Told him that Abdullah may write and I would answer, but no interview, neither on board his ship nor on shore. I also said that if anybody attempted to land within my fences I would shoot, no matter whom. On that he lifted his hands to heaven, scandalized and then paddled away pretty smartly, to report, I suppose. An hour or so afterwards I saw Willems land a boat party at the Rajas. It was very quiet, not a shot was fired, and there was hardly any shouting. They tumbled those brass guns you presented to Patalolo last year down the bank into the river. It's deep there, close to. The channel runs that way, you know. About five Willems went back on board, and I saw him join Abdullah by the wheel aft. He talked a lot, swinging his arms about, seemed to explain things, pointed at my house, then down the reach. Finally, just before sunset, they hove upon the cable and dredged the ship down nearly half a mile to the junction of the two branches of the river, where she is now, as you might have seen. Lingard nodded. That evening after dark, I was informed, Abdullah landed for the first time in Sambir. He was entertained in Sahamin's house. I sent Ali to the settlement for news. He returned about nine and reported that Patalolo was sitting on Abdullah's left hand before Sahamin's fire. There was a great council. Ali seemed to think that Patalolo was a prisoner, but he was wrong there. They did the trick very neatly. Before midnight everything was arranged as I can make out. Patalolo went back to his demolished stockade, escorted by a dozen boats with torches. It appears he begged Abdullah to let him have a passage in the Lord of the Isles to Penang. From there he would go to Mecca. The firing business was alluded to as a mistake. No doubt it was in a sense. Patalolo never meant resisting. So he is going as soon as the ship is ready for sea. He went on board next day with three women and half a dozen fellows as old as himself. By Abdullah's orders he was received with the salute of seven guns and he has been living on board ever since, five weeks. I doubt whether he will leave the river alive. At any rate, he won't live to reach Penang. Lakamba took over all his goods and gave him a draft on Abdullah's house payable in Penang. He is bound to die before he gets there, don't you see? He sat silent for a while in dejected meditation, 
then went on. Of course there were several rows during the night. Various fellows took the opportunity of the unsettled state of affairs to pay off old scores and settle old grudges. I passed the night in that chair there, dozing uneasily. Now and then there would be a great tumult and yelling which would make me sit up, revolver in hand. However, nobody was killed. A few broken heads, that's all. Early in the morning Willems caused them to make a fresh move which I must say surprised me not a little. As soon as there was daylight they busied themselves in setting up a flagpole on the space at the other end of the settlement where Abdullah is having his houses built now. Shortly after sunrise there was a great gathering at the flagpole. All went there. Willems was standing leaning against the mast, one arm over that woman's shoulders. They had brought an armchair for Patalolo, and Lakamba stood on the right hand of the old man who made a speech. Everybody in Sambir was there, women, slaves, children, everybody. Then Patalolo spoke. He said that by the mercy of the Most High he was going on a pilgrimage. The dearest wish of his heart was to be accomplished. Then, turning to Lakamba, he begged him to rule justly during his, Patalolo's, absence. There was a bit of play-acting there. Lakamba said he was unworthy of the honorable burden, and Patalolo insisted. Poor old fool! It must have been bitter to him. They made him actually entreat that scoundrel. Fancy a man compelled to beg of a robber to despoil him. But the old Rajah was so frightened. Anyway, he did it, and Lakamba accepted at last. Then Willems made a speech to the crowd, said that on his way to the west the Rajah, he meant Patalolo, would see the great white ruler in Batavia and obtain his protection for Zambir. Meanwhile, he went on, I and Orange Blanda and your friend, hoist the flag under the shadow of which there is safety. With that he ran up a Dutch flag to the masthead. It was made hurriedly during the night of cotton stuffs, and being heavy hung down the mast while the crowd stared. Ali told me there was a great sigh of surprise, but not a word was spoken till Lakamba advanced and proclaimed in a loud voice that during all that day everyone passing by the flagstaff must uncover his head and salaam before the emblem. But hang it all, exclaimed Lingar, Abdullah is British. Abdullah wasn't there at all, did not go on shore that day. Yet Ali, who has his wits about him, noticed that the space where the crowd stood was under the guns of the Lord of the Isles. They put a core warp ashore and gave the bark a count in the current so as to bring the broadside to bear on the flagstaff. Clever, eh? But nobody dreamt of resistance. When they recovered from the surprise, there was a little quiet jeering and Bahasan abused Lakamba violently till one of Lakamba's men hit him on the head with a staff. Frightful crack, I am told. Then they left off jeering. Meantime Patalolo went away, and Lakamba sat in the chair at the foot of the flagstaff while the crowd surged around, as if they could not make up their minds to go. Suddenly there was a great noise behind Lakamba's chair. It was that woman who went for Willems. Ali says she was like a wild beast, but he twisted her wrist and made her grovel in the dust. Nobody knows exactly what it was about. Some say it was about that flag. He carried her off, flung her into a canoe, and went on board Abdullah's ship. After that Sahamin was the first to salaam to the flag. Others followed suit. Before noon everything was quiet in the settlement, and Ali came back and told me all this. Almayer drew a long breath. Lingard stretched out his legs. Go on, he said. Almayer seemed to struggle with himself. At last he spluttered out. The hardest is to tell yet. The most unheard of thing. An outrage. A fiendish outrage. End of chapter 2. Recording by Tom Weiss. Tom's Audiobooks.com.